You should never do anything in the expectation that when you've finished it, there will be this sort of kind of unbelievable happiness and joy will arrive uh, on this huge big bus and it will just run towards you and hug you. It, you have to enjoy something that Greg McGee said to me when we were uh, working together on Fallout, because Greg came with me on one research trip to America, and every night Greg would say, we'd go to a good restaurant, whether it be San Francisco or Washington, He'd say, no, 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 we've worked hard today. Let's go and have a good meal and a good bottle of wine. And he said something which he can't remember saying, but I remember him saying it. He said, we should enjoy every step of the journey because we may never arrive. And that's absolutely true. It's the journey which is, um, if you've got to enjoy the journey, because one, you may not finish, or two, you may get to the end, and there is no huge you know, pile of joy waiting for you to, you know, great big swimming pool of joy you can swim in. You have to enjoy the process itself. And I did enjoy the process itself of shooting Separation City. It was it was it was a huge amount of fun. You know, as a middle-aged man, late middle-aged man, you get to play, you know, costumes and games and run around doing all the things that kids do, but and adults are not allowed to do. It was fun. The first scripts that were turned down were pretty rough and um, probably weren't as emotionally honest. When I did my stage play, uh, Daylight Atheist. Um, I was emotionally honest in that and I made a bigger connection with an audience. So I thought I went back and looked at uh, Separation City and said I'll have to be more honest. So the scenes which I think work best are the ones where are completely fictitious and where I was writing uh, as, as emotionally honestly as I could. Murray asked me if I would help him and I was terribly flattered because I'd never done a movie before. And he told the producers he wanted to, wanted to write with me, which took them by surprise as well. So I sat down with Murray and, and I said, Murray, you've got go back through all your old comic strips. You've got so many magic moments. But he said, they're only, they're only tiny fragments. They're only four panels long and a, a movie is, is vast. So I said, can we try and save at least some of them? I don't think a single gag from any of his comic strips actually ended up in a movie because Murray wanted to write it all new. But he would, we would discuss certain things and then Murray would write, or draw rather, incidents from the movie that he, he wanted to be in. He would just instantly tear off these fantastic drawings and we ended up plotting a sheet of white paper right around my attic in, in, in Wagetown, Wellington. We just had this big continuous loop of paper and he would draw little moments and incidents and I would, uh, my job later on was to try and write linking scenes and dialogue to go with those, those moments. And it was just absolute fun. I, I, we didn't have a crossword. We worked together for about two and a half years. I would go up to Gisborne, he would come down, and it was pure fun. Uh, New Zealand is a small little country, and you're only supposed to wear one hat. If you're wearing two hats, you're not, someone else has gone around bareheaded. I was a journalist, and um, TVNZ asked me if I wanted to do a, write anything for television and I was a parliamentary correspondent. And I had been a student nurse when I was at Massey University. I was a volunteer in a psychiatric hospital. And one of the patients I had was anorexia. And I said, well, that was fascinating. This student girl, she was so cunning and manipulative. So I did a very serious play called Inside Every Thin Girl about anorexia nervosa. I approached TVNZ and said, look, I could do a television series around David Longy, nuclear free devaluation, taking on the Americans. And they said, yeah, we're keen. So I wrote a four by one series called Fallout, which was very serious. And they, they brought in Greg McGee and uh, as my co-writer after I'd done quite a lot of initial work because they wanted someone a bit more polished, with more craft than I had at the time. And we did Fallout, which was um, uh, controversial at the time, but in some quarters very well. The Americans liked it. They, they were horrified. The former American ambassador came back to New Zealand, took me out to lunch and said, I was horrified when I heard you were doing Fallout because we saw you as a goddamn commie. But he watched it in America. It was given to him by Richard Armitage, who was Ronald Reagan's you know, Under Secretary of Defence. The Americans watched it and said it was very fair. It was accurate and fair. Having done Fallout and having travelled you know, around the world and up and down New Zealand with David Longy, and I knew him very well, I, did, I put in a one-page treatment of what, how I would do a documentary on David Longy. Danny and I got the gig. I was able to go back and talk to all the players and they were being interviewed, and because I knew the whole story pretty much, because I, it was the, most, the best journalism I've ever done in my life, uh, I was able to say to people, didn't such and such happen? They'd go, no, no, and i go, yes, but, but so-and-so was in the room, and there was that lamp was there, and this person was there, and that person was there, and someone brought in lamingtons, and you didn't want Earl Grey tea because you didn't like Earl Grey tea, you said, can I have English breakfast? 
And once they knew, you knew everything, they'd go, oh, well, that's right. And, they, and when they knew, it was one of those rare occasions when you do a story when you virtually know everything and you, and you get the players to confirm it in their own words. And then every now and again, they go further and they tell you things that you didn't know. So they confirmed everything we did know and they said it really well. Then they threw in other things as well. And uh, that documentary came together really, really well because 20 years after the, after the event, also, there was what's the point of holding on to secrets? You know, they were all incredibly candid, and they were nicer about each other than they would have been even 15 years later. They, they, they suddenly a lot of the old anger had died down, and they just thought, well, let's just tell the truth. In politics, to get a politician like Muldoon and a politician like David Longy to cover is a, is a great privilege and a gift because they're both extraordinary men and. You just got so many great stories out of both of them. So I've been very lucky, incredibly lucky as a journalist. I did a drama on Muldoon in the press gallery called Press for Service, and he was asked about it at one of his press conferences, one of the press conferences I wasn't allowed to attend. And, and he said, ah, I saw Press for Service. Yes, very accurate. He enjoyed it. Because I, I was making fun of the, of the gallery. I was making more fun of the gallery than I was of the... Uh, of the politicians, because when Muldoon, when I was thrown out, every single journalist, including all my dear friends, <laughs> they all sat there, you know. Mind you, I probably would have sat there too with someone else. I mean, they all go, oh, this is terrible, someone should do something. He should do something, he should do something. And they all sat rooted to the spot where I got asked to leave. He's got fantastic energy, Danny, and he's a fantastic director of comedy. And we were putting us various, various ideas to get for television, trying to persuade Tony Holden to do various things. He wasn't much interested. And one day, the New Zealand writer-director, Anthony McCartan, was around at my house. And we were having drinks and, again, telling lies. And Anthony said, oh, I really love Danny's Gormsby. And I said, oh, Danny, I've never heard of Mr. Gormsby. And Danny said, oh, it's something I used to do on stage as a stand-up routine. And, and Anthony begged him to perform it right there. He begged him. And so Danny suddenly got up and started being Mr. Gormsby in the living room. And I was just on the floor in hysterics. It was, instantly outrageous and vulgar and rude and real and authentic. Uh, we had a meeting with Tony Holden the next day and I said, you know, we had about seven or eight ideas and we did the other ideas and Tony was going, nah, nah, nah. Short little bloke, Tony, and his feet hardly hit the floor. He going, nah, nah, nah. Danny said, we've got Mr. Gormsby too. Tony said, okay, what's that, what's that? Danny leapt to his feet and did the Gormsby strutting in front of the classroom routine. And Tony had the same reaction that I did. Tony nearly fell off his chair, wetting himself with laughter, and saying, I love it, I love it, I love it, I want it, I want it. So uh, we, he picked Gormsby and rejected everything else. It got fantastic reviews in Australia, actually, Gormsby. People were sniffy about it here, but the Aussies thought it was wonderful, and, and uh, it got great reviews and rated very well on the ABC. And they, they're still repeating Gormsby series one and series two in Australia, and we get huge fan mail, and there were web, web pages devoted to Gormsby. We got on like a house on fire. He was surprisingly shy. Turned out he'd, you know, he's, he'd read all my columns and books and stuff, and he was a, he was a bit of a fan of my writing. So um, I'm not saying he, was, he wasn't awestruck by me, I was awestruck by him, but he was genuinely shy. And I introduced him to Irish whiskey that night in Canberra. And we had lunch together the next day at Sydney Airport, and and uh, we, became, we became friends. And I said to him, you know, no one's ever made the film of your life yet. Oh, the right person hasn't asked. I said, I'd love to do it. And he said, oh, you are the right person. And he gave me the, um, gave me the job. I said, think about it, Ed, you, you hardly know me. And I said, let's talk again after Christmas. And we talked again after Christmas, and he said, and he was even further convinced. He said, you are the guy to tell the story of my life. Uh, and, uh, in the process, in the long road to make the movie, I have made a four by one hour documentary for TVNZ, a one by 75 hour documentary for Channel 4 UK. And I was the director of the tribute one, which was a very grim job to actually fly to Nepal and talk to people about the death of someone they loved. And you, you know, you say, well, Sir Edmund's not very well and he's, you know, he's going to die soon. And you know, and how do you feel about him? And they would all burst into tears. And I'd burst into tears as well, you know, we're all, in that high altitude to get a bit weepy anyway. So, you know, the film crew and I were going around sort of sniffing and snuffling in this rather grim, wintry landscape. 